We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Okay, guys, welcome back to the podcast. And uh, so, yeah, I'll I'll, um, I'll get a little bit um, of information from you, Roy, when we kick things off, but I was just wanted to start off by saying that most of the listeners have never heard me speak about jujitsu or to someone who's interested in jujitsu or martial arts before. Uh, the, the podcast is normally about philosophy and psychology and, you know, and, and spiritualism and all that kind of thing. But there is a, I feel like whenever I watch your content and I'm obsessed with your content, by the way, that there is a, a deeper meaning to it, you know, whether, whether it comes from at the very end of your videos and it's all about discovering who you are or, you know, identifying yourself as a seeker on, on your podcast in the, in the episodes that you did, I, I really wanted to get you on the show to kind of talk about martial arts as a way of life and a, and a way for us to cultivate our, our own individuality. So that's a, that's a long winded approach for me to basically say, mate, thank you so much for doing the show and welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. Cool. So yeah. So for the listeners, mate, um, could you just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and, um, and kind of what brings you to 2021? (laughs) Sure. Um, so I got started in martial arts, uh, when I was pretty young, um, I was sent to Japan as an exchange student when I was 16 and they encouraged me to train in judo over there. And so I got involved in judo and then eventually Aikido and from Aikido to Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and eventually Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So most of my athletic career has been in the Jiu-Jitsu realm, different, you know, flavors, but they're all sister arts. And so those principles of distraction angles and leverage have been um, instrumental for helping me understand myself and helping me navigate in the world. Yeah, that's awesome. So what, um, what actually moved you to Japan in your teenage years? So I wanted, so I grew up in Anchorage, Alaska, and I was very interested in just getting out of Alaska. (laughs) I felt like there was more, there was a lot more, uh, to be done, to be seen. So I checked in with, um, the high school I was going to, and they had a rotary exchange program that was operating. They were just doing interviews for it. Someone had canceled. I slid into their spot and it was just one of those things. And then I actually wanted to go to Sweden. Um, I was more interested in like Swedish blondes and then going to like a military school in Japan. But yeah. that's, that's the way it worked out. And it uh, changed the course of my life uh, pretty dramatically. You know, and getting involved in judo showed me... Um, there's a certain truth that comes through in martial arts. And so a lot of my quest has been discovering the truth Mm. about martial arts. You know, there's, uh, I guess we would call them traditional martial arts or TMAs. Um, Back in the day when um, essentially information about martial arts was limited to books, unless you were training in person with somebody, Mm. um, you could get away with a lot. You know, you could tell tall tales. You could um, revert to an authority figure when it came, when it came to you know finding some kind of validation for your art. But um, over the years, I found that jujitsu is this perennial technology that allows people to um, discover more about themselves. Discover you know, connect with kind of a biofeedback, a biofeedback mechanism that, uh, that allows them to like, see what works, see what doesn't, mm. you know, and for those that are involved in the art of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or Judo, or some of these, you know, arts that involve randori or sparring, there's something about just understanding how you did in that interaction with the other person. Yeah. And there's no lying. There's no like fronting, pretending, Oh, I could have done this or I could have done that. Like what happened, happened. And 
for a lot of people, they find that deeply, deeply satisfying. And as someone who's been seeking the truth in martial arts for a long time, um, it centers you as to what real well, they're actually much more capable than they ever imagined. Mm. It's, it's true. And when you say uh, seeking the truth in martial arts, is that in terms of which is the truest martial arts, which can be applied to, to all aspects, whether it's, uh, you know, getting yourself into a scuffle on the street or, or what can be applied into the UFC? Is that, is that how, what you mean? You know, over the years, I've realized that my interest in martial arts is not always aligned with what other people are interested in. People go in for a variety of reasons. Uh, often self-defense is like a, a precursor for their interest. You know, they, they get attacked or there's some kind of uncomfortable situation. So they want to know what works. Um, for other people, it's much more social. It's, or you know, the kids are involved. So they want to do something they can share with their children. So, you know, for a lot of, a lot of people, like the litmus test of what actually works is like way beyond what they're actually interested in. Mm. So for me, being able to, you know, being able to kind of discover who I was, like my male identity, you know, a lot of guys want to tap into their own personal power, but they're not quite sure how to do it. So, you know, it could be done through lifting weights or joining the military, doing, doing different, you know, um, rites of passage. Um, which are kind of forgotten about in our society. I mean, get your driver's license in America at 16 and you can legally drink at 21. And those are like the big rites of passage. I mean, marriage, children, of course, those as well. But, you know, for the young man entering an adult world, um, martial arts was that kind of litmus test that let me know, no, you're a man now. Mm. And and now I, I think through the art that I teach, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or just Jiu-Jitsu, uh, I'm able to offer a path where people can discover a little bit more about themselves by being put under duress. Mm -hmm. I mean, you need to be able to temper your spirit by putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. Um, that's where we re like really understand what we're made of the resiliency of the human spirit, you know, it can be on display in those moments. Mm -hmm. It's not just for the Olympics, you know, yes. and yeah. we can have, we can bring that into our own lives. Yeah. I, I, I could not agree more. And um, yeah, there's a few points I'd love to, to, to hit on there, but yeah. One is that um, male rights of passage passage thing that you spoke about there. Obviously you and I can both only speak from the male perspective, but I felt like that was kind of lost, you know, on me, um, as, as well. And it's, I don't think it, there's no one to blame individually, but I think as a society we've lost the, you know, we look back on these kind of male rites of passage and we see them almost as barbaric, but there was a real kind of importance. There needs to be a, 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 a very distinct separation between, okay, you know, you're a teenager or you're a child and, you know, life, you know, you're Peter Pan, God of everything, God of nothing. Mm -hmm. And now you're an adult and you have to take responsibility and you have to cultivate a path well, someone can at least provide some kind of way for you to begin and, and narrowing your gaze can reduce a lot of the existential anxiety and threat that pervades a lot of the culture for, for young uh, men these days, you know, and obviously women aren't without their issues as well, but I have certainly found, and I'm a white belt now, hopefully we'll be uh, on the path to get my blue belt by the end of the mm -hmm. year, but I've certainly found that having you know, because testosterone is 16 times on average higher than, than it is after puberty than, than it is for women. Having some kind of way to um, integrate my aggression and need to just do something on, a, on, a, on the mat, just I, I feel so much more present, you know, and I've been practicing mm -hmm. meditation for a long time and I never feel quite as present as I do after a jujitsu training session. You know, I've just much more is coming into me and um, it just feels very, very like life is very clear and it all makes sense. So I totally agree with you with that. And I, I used to have a CrossFit background and mm -hmm. with CrossFit, you could kind of hide a little bit here and there. Not that I would obviously, you know, try to, but you could you know, cheat a few reps if you needed to. And people do yeah. that. And I've noticed that, but uh -huh. when it uh -huh. comes to jujitsu, it's like <clears throat> you tapped the per your opponent mm -hmm. knows you tapped 
but that's a good thing because the black belts have tapped the most. That's why they're the most humble, you know, and um, I haven't really come across anything that, that is kind of like jujitsu for, for, you know, adult cultivation and individuality. It's a really powerful technology. Um, I've chosen to devote a substantial portion of my life to it because it is, it's not the complete answer, but it's definitely part of the answer. Mm. And just knowing that um, inspires me to be able to connect to people in different ways. And I do that through a lot of different media formats. Um, that's important. The technology itself, jujitsu, is uh, a human technology perennial. Um, you know, back in the days of the samurai, it was used. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't attribute too much to what we do these days to, you know, it's not like we have a direct line, but it's more about a jujitsu allows people to, um, to fulfill the needs they need in their society at that moment. So you can apply jujitsu principles and techniques against weapons. We don't really use weapons, bladed weapons, swords, knives, you know, sticks, Hanbo, Joe, whatever, all these various weapons. And you can apply jujitsu to that. You can do it to guns. You know, now we've kind of out of the kind of Brazilian machismo model, it's one-on-one -on -one ground fighting competition. And the technology continues to evolve as people want to find new ways to win, different ways of, um, you know, exploring all the angles of the dynamic sphere. Mm. You know, not just like the straight line and the 90 degrees, but let's get into the 45 degrees, the 73 degrees. There are different ways and, and finding innovative entries into the time honored leg locks, chokes and arm bars that we, they've done for, you know, since since forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and being able to have jujitsu like serve humanity. I mean, it happens to be in one-on-one -on -one confrontations on a, on a mat in a very structured format. Totally great. Mm -hmm. But jujitsu will continue to evolve. Yes. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, it's interesting now that, you know, as you say, with, with uh, modern day mediums platforms, you know, your YouTube channel being one, uh, I think Joe Rogan has done a lot for jujitsu. Um, oh, for sure. You know, Jocko Willink, these kinds of guys as mm -hmm. well. And just, you know, the psychological significance of what jujitsu can afford to people. And I think there's, there's a lot to be said about how comfortable we are in the West and how, and how much we are wired to survive. And jujitsu offers, uh, I suppose, an entry into who we might be if we were put into life-threatening situations. And I think mm. what it really does at least in terms of uh, anxiety and, you know, reducing our stress is that the more we, you know, practice martial arts um, and, and jujitsu, you know, specifically, the more we kind of build a sense of confidence in knowing that, you know, God forbid, if that were to ever happen, at least I, I wouldn't just fall into complete collapse and to learn helplessness. And obviously that's how traumatic experiences occur. But when we know that, if something could happen, because that's what anxiety is. Obviously it's the, the what if thoughts, it's the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the worst future scenario. If we at least kind of have a map in those, in those terrible worlds, we're, we're going to feel a lot more like we can actually dip in and, and, and calm ourselves in the present moment, because there is actual, there isn't a need to prepare or be worried about, um, about what might happen, you know? That worry about what might happen. Okay. Look, I'm a, black belt over six feet tall. You know, I, I haven't had to like really step into that mindset for a, a lot, for a long time mm. that women operate in constantly Yes, of what might happen, mm. you know? And so they view the world very, very differently. The confidence that jujitsu has given me, of course I'm tall. And so people are less likely to, to pick on me, but the confidence that it's given me is a real confidence. Mm. It's not a kind of like, oh, I'm tight and I'm, I'm muscled up and I'm, I'm, I'm projecting all the things that make me very, you know, alpha or dominant or all these projections that we have with the tats or whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people will create this fierce image, but the confidence that you get from jujitsu of just being able to, I'll be able to roll with whatever situation happens. You know, you're not worried. 
that's a real sense of confidence I, I think more people need to tap into. Um, it's earned. It's not given. And being able to um, just get more people. I mean, it's a well, we can create a well-armed society without arms. Mm. And a well-armed society is a polite society. So I, th- I, think there's, I think there's a lot there in terms of like reducing anxiety, fear reduction. Um, I don't worry about getting attacked. You know, not that, oh, I know this move or that move. It's that I just have been able to create spontaneous leverage through my body positioning for a long time. And so, it, I mean, for years, I, I dealt with like the fantasy scenario. Oh, what if somebody attacks me like this or like <laughs> this? Right. You, yes. you run those yes. as men. It's like, oh, and I, I want to be able to, but those disappear over time. Mm. You're like, eh, this probably won't happen. Yes. And, and if I can go back to your point on how centered you feel after mm-hmm. doing a jujitsu session and how it, how clear everything is, there's no delusions. It just wipes us away. And, you know, and I've meditated on and off for a number of years and there's something about I prefer like Zen meditation. I don't really focus on anything. I just like, I liken it to, you know, our daily life, the, the pot of water of our thoughts is boiling, you know, and then in Zen meditation, you just, you just turn down the heat, man. And it really reduces. And it's, you know, if I can get it down to a simmer, that's good. The the monks, when you look in their eyes are like, Oh, that's still water. Yes, (laughs) it is. That's crazy. That's beautiful. (laughs) And jujitsu kind of forces you into this one pointed concentration of somebody attacking you. So all your thought is there and dr- work relationship drama, all that stuff just drops. So, you know, in the, in the Zen um, stories, when the master says like to drop it, you jujitsu is a mechanism which allows that to happen mm. because it's so, system intensive you drop the other applications and are just working on this it's it's brilliant in that way and you know i don't find myself being able to meditate as often as i you know we all go through seasons and sometimes you're just too wound up to you should do that but you're not doing it you know but jujitsu can just take you from a wide range of moods and energy levels and boom, bring you right back to that present moment yeah, it, it is really fascinating. And, you know, you could just imagine myself spending years and years trying to drop everything through meditation, you know, or I could just pay for a jujitsu class. And, you know, I mean, it wouldn't be very good if I was focusing on, you know, relationships or work or whatever it is when someone's trying to attack my neck, you know, that probably wouldn't, uh, I'd probably tap pretty quickly doing that. So it's, uh, the only, honestly, the only other thing that I've found that has kind of worked in that way for me anyway has been, um, psychedelics and, and having experiences that with, with, with psychedelics, mm-hmm. but it's, uh, it, it is phenomenal. And, um, so I, w- I wanted to go back to your, um, teenage years when you moved to Japan, just for context for the listeners as well. Sure. So did you, you start with judo or was it Aikido? I started with judo. I did a little karate when I was a, a, a child, but I didn't really go that far in it. And then when I was 16, they encouraged me to do a Japanese art after school. I selected judo. They warned me that it was very severe training. And, but I was kind of, I had some teenage angst. I was 16. I wanted to get muscles and I wanted to like, you know, want to learn how to fight. Mm. You want to learn how to fight. So I joined my Japanese judo team, um, school judo team. It's very similar to how wrestling is here in the U S. So we would do the classes and compete every month and, Eventually, I earned enough tournament wins to receive my shodan or first degree black belt. Mm. Squeaked that in by the end of the year, which was okay. But I mean, the it's it's an interesting. You can go pretty far with one or two throws in judo. Uh, it, I would say in BJJ, your level of um, technical knowledge has to be a lot. I mean, in that system. But your, your level of technical know-how is just, it's, it's a lot longer path. Mm. And that's not to say that, I mean, I love judo. I respect judo. It is a young man's art, though. 
And after a certain amount of time, you have to kind of let that go. And, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu now offers the intensity yet is low impact, which, uh, which allows you to continue to develop and create, you know, there's so many powerful, powerful aspects of Jiu Jitsu, not to mention, I mean, like, let's just be super basic touch. Mm. A lot of people don't get touched mm. in the, in this in this world, you know, aside from their lover or their children, or maybe a hearty handshake from a business associate, but they don't get touched. And I mean, years ago, I remember watching Ukemi, like rolling exercises in judo. And one of the, one of the people was saying, oh, it was very good for your internal organs, like slapping the mat. And I was like, hmm, that has, that, that has nothing to do with those <laughs> Things have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. <laughs> but they were right. The vibration goes through your body. Mm. You know, and, and in yoga, you get in all kinds of unusual binds, position stretches to pump blood in and out, to restrict blood flow so it comes back in. You know, and we do that with the aggression of our opponent squeezing us, mm. they're doing us a favor. Now it's all about keeping within the bounds, but the way that you are controlling and squeezing another person is incredibly therapeutic. Mm. Even if you're, you know, we, we turn this into really a therapeutic tool and it's, it's not so much about the tap. It's more about the interactions. Yes. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are just <laughs> one thing I tried to tell myself before this podcast is like, now, Tom, we're not just going to uh, talk about the benefits of jiu-jitsu for an hour here. <laughs> it's <a bit> difficult <laughs> not to when you've got two people that obviously. It, it, it is. And we, and we can go in and we can go in any direction. I mean, and, and one of the reasons I, I was excited about doing your podcast is, um, you know, if it's straight jiu-jitsu podcast, it's usually the same kind of questions. Yes. And and I think it's cool that, you know, you're into other things, you're dabbling in psychedelics, you know, uh, these are, these are, um, we can rely on different kinds of technologies mm. to help advance our society. Jiu-Jitsu is one of them. Yes. I couldn't, I could not agree more. And, yeah. you know, it's, um, it's great, you know, that we live in a world now where, you know, we have access, like the fact that I can just email you, you know, across the, oh, yeah. across the globe. You know, I think, I think I always tell everyone that everyone should have a podcast because it's so brilliant, you know, to be able to speak to, to people that just have completely different lives and perspectives and, um, and tools and, and ideas that, that can help us all. And, you know, not, not, not too long ago, I was speaking to a uh, clinical psychologist who was actually administering uh, psychedelic mushrooms to her mm. terminally ill cancer patients as a way mm. to help them deal with death anxiety and some mm -hmm. of the results that she's getting are absolutely phenomenal, you know, and I, to, to kind of broaden that out, what I'm interested in mostly is finding a way in life, you know, and what has worked for me has just been learning and growing and, and envisioning a path and moving towards that. And you can kind of see how jujitsu fits that mold so well. It's like there's a black belt somewhere down there. I recognize that going day by day is making me enjoy the journey so that the black belt almost becomes arbitrary. But when I get it, hopefully one day, it's going to be the coolest thing in the world. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's another reason why uh, I think jujitsu is so cool is because it's so applicable to life in that, you never reach a point where you've beaten jujitsu. And one of the coolest things about watching your content is that the way you roll with your students is you will reward good position, good technique. You know, you see that in, in how you, you will tap if, if they have managed to move themselves into a position that's, um, that's really efficient. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I love about it is your, you often don't breathe through your mouth. It doesn't look like you're, you know, it looks like you're very much in the moment, you know, and it's very hard. I mean, obviously me as a white belt, it's hard not to get lost in all that kind of stuff. So for me to oh, stay yeah. relaxed and just breathe through my nose, it's difficult. What's even cooler is that when I've seen you roll with your teacher, Roy Harris, he doesn't look like he's actually breathing through his mouth, you know? Mm -hmm. So he looks oh, like yeah. he's just in this zone. So there's always stepping stones for us. And it's such a great application for life because we need to remember that, we're not chasing a destination. We're chasing uh, the 
ability to fall in love with the journey. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I just think it's, it's, it's awesome. Hey, well, you know, my teacher, I'm very fortunate to have had many great teachers that, you know, have showed the path to me and I try to pass that on. Uh, there are levels, mm -hmm. you know, and it's okay to just be at the level that you're at. That's one thing. Some people feel like, Oh, you have to be, a top competitive black belt right now. I've seen a lot of competitors come and go. There's over the years, there's a lot of people that that's a very finite time mm. uh, in a person's life. And, you know, it's one expression of the art, but it's an art. Judo is an art practiced as a sport. Jujitsu is the same way. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. It's, uh, it's cool as well because, you know, most sports, uh, there, there is a finite amount of time that you can do it because your body just gives up. But you watch people like yourself and, and Roy and, and Rick as well. And, uh, you know, he's almost crowned at old man jujitsu or whatever it is. But oh, yeah. <laughs> it's good for me in 20, 30 years' time. I'm like, cool, I've just got to look after my body and hopefully I'm still, still on the path. A hundred percent, you know, and it encourages you to, you know, and there are guys that I am, uh, that I train with that are, senpai to me uh you know they've been training they're like 60s mm. even 70s wow training and you know we and those are the people that i pay my dues with like if they're gonna roll with somebody and they ask me i am there mm. do you have someone roy i do now <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> yeah that's yeah. so cool so so you're in japan you've got your black belt i'm actually that would have been I was thinking initially when you said that moving to Japan and then getting involved in judo would have been quite difficult because of the language barrier as well. But I imagine that judo would have almost offered you a means of communication without language. Am I on the money there? Or? Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And I didn't really ever understand any of the instruction. And some of the people would talk to me in English a little bit, but, um, but really it came down to uh, just observing the movements and replicating it. Mm. And that is, and so even in my teaching now, I realize the power of just stepping out of the way and allowing people to see, you can see, you can do, you know, and maybe they can't do it perfectly in the first way. They only approximate the shape of the technique, but very often words obscure people, can talk too much, mm. give too many details, too many things that people aren't ready for. Um, that can be problematic. You know, you, you got to find that, that balance and jujitsu is a, again, a wonderful mechanism to find some balance, you know, yeah. uh, between tachi waza and ne waza between standing techniques and bottom and uh, groundwork. You need them both, mm. you know, um, between receiving techniques and being aggressive. And especially for guys that are like at the purple belt level, um, you, if they're really lopsided or they're an amazing guard player or just all top all the time, I'm like, okay, you got to get more well-rounded a, a brown belt. You need to, you need to be well-rounded, good top, good bottom. You know, you can do a fast and loose game. You can do a slow and tight game. You have to be able to be the complement. Mm. You know, and, and you can explain it elementally too. Like if they're fire, you need to be watery or wind or earth, you know, earth puts out a fire just as well as, as like a gust of wind or water. Now there are many ways you can mix and match, but it's about uh, being complementary uh, to your opponent. I mean, even when I roll with re some really, really strong and tough guys now, or someone who's just kind of like going for it. Every once in a while, I'll run into someone who really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> They've seen your videos. They want to keep they're, they're going, back. They're going for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't defend the title like I, I used to, but sometimes the answer is to just tell myself, no, relax, soft, mm. soft, playful. Because if I get into some, they're hard, I'm hard, something's going to break. Yeah. You know, it's, and it's funny when you can be soft and really kind of allow them to do their thing, you will find your moment. You'll be relaxed and fast mm. to find the moment to turn it all around. 
and then you're in control and you know and you and then you tap them and it ends up the whole round being ends up being much more efficient than if you were trying to overpower them or outgun them mm. that's yeah. i think that's uh, one of the great things about watching the way you roll and uh you know and i, I hope that for people that are listening to this that aren't actually too involved um in jujitsu you know we just try to remember the psychological significance of what we're talking about here and all that kind of stuff. But I would recommend checking out um, Roy's videos, but the way you're moving with your opponents, you know, you, you might see someone at a higher level, at a higher level or even a lower level, trying to, you know, bash through your guard or do whatever it is. And you can go with them, you know, so that's being mm. that kind of water to their fire or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but falling into a position up, you know, even just from a practical example, I've seen so many times that someone might go for a, an ankle pick or a leg pick on you or whatever it is. And, um, you're very happy to give them the leg, but just sneakily grab their belt at the same time. So they might go for the takedown, but you end out on, on top, you know, and right. Uh, right. It's a, it's a classic example of how you don't bashing and crashing is, is one way you know, but it's a, it's, it's a short term way. <laughs> it's one way. And sometimes that's the way mm. um, when I was, you know, but it's, it's not the only way. And the, one of the best things about jujitsu is, is that it makes you keep an open mind and be accepting of change or an alternate approach. Okay. Whatever. What they said would work doesn't work. Mm. Okay. I need to find a different way. And then you, you know, it helps you think outside the box a little bit. And I think if we can apply that mentality um, to our other systems, government systems, for example, where, okay, we tried this and often, you know, government programs, there's like a moralistic element to it as well. You know, oh, well, I'll be a bad person if we don't do this or vote that way or whatever. It's, I, I'm much more utilitarian. Mm -hmm. it makes it makes you, me, um, just think, let's try a different way. That way didn't work for whatever reason. You know, there's a, there's a big homelessness problem in America, mm -hmm. um, in Seattle, in Portland, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles. And a lot of the policies, um, which were meant to help people and, you know, people want to be compassionate. They're just not working. Mm. They're, they're not working. Some of, the, some of the methods to decriminalize, it's just not working. Mm. And we don't need to judge people. Oh, you know, it's more about, okay, let's find a different way. Let's do the opposite and see what happens. Mm. Okay. Maybe there's a middle ground between the opposite and what we were doing before, but that kind of application, real life application of, of, of non-attachment. Yes. That's real non-attachment. Okay. That's not working. Let's try something else. Uh, I, I think that is what, we, honestly, that's what we need. If we're going to survive as a species on this planet, we have to endorse more of that, more flexibility. I, to I totally agree. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I recently finished reading uh, Obama's um, memoir and he said that one of the reasons uh, why Lincoln was so good at, now correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm obviously Australian, but I'm not too bad in American politics, but I'm pretty sure it was Lincoln who freed the slaves. Um, but uh you know, he said one of the reasons why he was able to do so is because he elected a whole bunch of people who didn't agree with him and had opposing views. And it was these people bouncing and forth, these, you know, these battleground of ideas and not saying, hey, because I have this idea, therefore, and going after the person, it was a battle of ideas, which is, again, kind of what you see in jiu-jitsu. It's like, I'm going to go for this head arm choke. Oh, they've pummeled. I'm going to go for a sweep then. It's constantly not being attached to these ideas. There's the application. And I think this is actually why, not to get too political, but I've never really understood strict partisan politics. I think conservatism as a political idea has a lot of importance. You know, even in my own life, structures and routines and things that have worked in the past, I need to maintain in order to retain a sense of self. But then if that gets too uh, extreme, I, I, I can't see beyond the horizon and I can't progress and be open to new ideas and they both are so important. And I think it's unfortunate where, where we can become so partisan. It's like, it's this way or the highway. It's like that no attachment idea is so profound. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I'm glad you, you could resonate with it. Cool. So you, uh, so you came back to Alaska after Japan. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and I was a year behind in school because I didn't get 
the academic credit for that year. Uh, I actually did, but I uh, couldn't find the um, the scroll that they had sent me with the with the diploma. So mm -hmm. I ended up being a year behind. Came back to Alaska, did judo again in Alaska um, for a while, but was really interested in Aikido. Mm -hmm. Spent my senior year because most of my friends have graduated. Um, spent my senior year in Canada actually doing some. At that time, they had grade thirteen. Oh, wow. um, in the U.S., you graduated grade twelve. Did a grade thirteen in in Canada, and that was um, or some of those classes. And the people were my age, and it was it was pretty cool. Uh, and then when I came back from Canada, I got I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to have a martial arts adventure, and so I started training Aikido, Aikikai Aikido, uh, which I felt was like the ultimate at that time. Mm. That, that was the ultimate art. That's what I really wanted to, um, I wanted to know, I heard stories of Kuichi Tohei um, taking on several judo players at once and tossing them all. And, and I thought, man, that's what I, that's the technique I need because mm. judo was hard. <laughs> judo, judo, it hurt. Yes. It worked, but it was, it was difficult. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm learning the wrong technology. I see it was actually the, the more advanced tech. Wow. Yeah, um, could talk and, that. Why not? Right, right. So eventually I got into that. I did that for a few years. And then I, um, and it wasn't quite adding up exactly the effectiveness level of Aikido was not aligning with all the training that I was doing. Mm. So I thought, cause I sparred with like a wrestler and who did a little BJJ and he just like smashed me. Oh, I mean, I, I had, a, I did a okay because of my judo training, but the Aikido stuff wasn't working mm. and I wasn't sure what that was all about because he, and here's the thing. I mean, this took like 20 years to understand the leverage is real but the situations are not okay you know and so when you feel real leverage you're like oh man that worked or that worked on me i really flipped or that was incredibly powerful but the situations are not in brazilian jiu-jitsu the leverage is real and the situations are messy and actual mm -hmm. you know and so you learn systems to kind of rope people into confining their movement so that you can eventually get a submission. You're kind of like corralling people. It's a, a, a system of eliminating movement options. Yes. Um, right. And so with Aikido, um, he was using the art of jujitsu to kind of fulfill a philosophical framework, a religious philosophical framework on nonviolence. Right. Um, so it's more defensive. It's, not about effectiveness. It's more about doing the techniques perfectly and, and your partner feeding you the perfect attack. So you can do the perfect defense. Right. Cause I've always, wondered, so, you know, yeah. you watch like a Steven Seagal movie and I always wondered that like all the attackers are coming individually. There's never a situation where it's like, okay, they all just surround Steven Seagal and then he just has to do Aikido on all these different people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's a little bit of a one at a time thing, which is reflective of. Although he did he did some amazing fight choreography mm -hmm. during those days. Of course, we're all inspired by Steven Seagal, mm -hmm. and um, and even before he came to the U.S., he did a movie called The Challenge, which actually has some very very realistic um, uh, fighting techniques, Aiki Jiu Jitsu techniques. Um, really excellent. It's an, it's an American movie filmed in Japan and he was oh, a fight cool. choreographer. It was like his first one that he did. It's, it's quite good. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, in Aikido, typically you blend an attack comes in, you blend with it and then redirect it. And if you do a lot of Aikido, you kind of expect all the situations to be like, well, if I just blend with it and redirect it, it'll be fine. That is the answer sometimes. Yeah. But sometimes the answer is to block. Yes. Don't blend. Sometimes the answer is to enter and preemptively get them off balance before they can even like enter the power zone. 
So as they're winding up and they do that in boxing as a shoulder stop or, you know, like they block you from even getting into the, the movement. Um, so blocking, entering, blending sometimes, but not all the time. And then with, with that, and that really helped me contextualize what Aikido was um, a lot more. It's a fighting technology. It's a, it's an art, but it's something that um, is meant to bring people together and it opens the umbrella of Budo. So the warrior arts, like not everyone can do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, there's a lot of ego sometimes it's much better now, but when I started, it was all about like, Oh man, you'll never even make it through the warm up. Well, it was so, it was like, Oh, only the toughest guys are doing this. Mm -hmm. The guys that wanted to go right to MMA, you know, they were doing BJJ and it was, it was about fighting. So being able to, being able to um, kind of open that umbrella of martial arts so that people that are in their 60s can do it. And it's more about connecting with the person. And, you know, that also leads to some weird attitudes. Of course. There, there's some definitely some weird attitudes in, in I mean, I love Aikido, uh, but I've, I've experienced some huge egos. Yes, of course. It brings some uh, extreme people. It's funny that you said, so when did you start jujitsu then? I started like real BJJ under a competent teacher. I did Japanese jujitsu um, for several years, but like really when I was about 23, 23. I started doing real BJJ under a man named Claudio Franza, who's up in, who's in, uh, in Santa Cruz, California. Ah, uh, yeah. So is that late nineties, mid to late nineties, early 2000s? That was late nineties. Uh, let's see. No, I, yes, that was late nineties. So I was, um, yeah, it was like 97, 98 ish. Okay. Yeah. So it must've gone through quite an interesting, no, I was just interested because, uh, you know, when you, when you mentioned that in the beginning, it was, it was all about, Hey, you won't even get through the warm up and all this kind of stuff. I started in 2019 and, uh, every, you know, there were a couple of black belts and brown belts in my old gym and I've moved out to the country now, but every kind of high grade belt I've met have, uh, have been some of the most humble people I've ever met. And I always thought that was because you, you, you have to put aside your ego if you want to progress in this sport, because, uh, your ego won't teach you how to do escape and defend and, and shrimp and, and, and choke. And I always thought that the black belts and the brown belts were the most humble because they'd, uh, they'd lost the most and yet were willing to continue on in spite of the, uh, the ego deaths, um, you know, for the sake of the martial arts. So I suppose it's a good thing that it's kind of changed a little bit since the late nineties. It's, it's much more inclusive. It's much, it's a much um, more friendly environment for women too. Mm -hmm. I knew some women in the early days that would go into the bathroom and cry. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, and, the, but they weren't going to quit, mm. you know? And so they really, in respect to some of those early pioneers. Um, but just about ego death. Yes. You, you do have to, you know, it's much safer if you leave your ego at the door. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And you need that tap early, tap off. And I tap, I, I tap to legit stuff. I tap to stuff that they know it wasn't legit, but I'm giving it to them anyway. And you better take it, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but you don't just like kill your ego. You actually have to kill your ego at every belt level, mm. at every belt level. Like you'll lose it. You, it'll come back at blue. Yeah. And then you have to kill it again to get purple and at purple, you know, to get Brown, you got it. You have to kill it. And even at, as a black belt, you do not. Sometimes that's when the ego like oh, really, you know, you got to open up the hand, got to yes. open up the hand, let it, let it flow. It, it would be hard. I can just put myself in that position now. It'd be hard not to uh, attach myself to, well, I'm a black belt. And if uh, a white belt has a good position on me, you know, you know, I'm just going to fight a little harder for him. <laughs> It'd be difficult not to do that. I have to spray paint my belt, I think. <laughs> what? It's, um, it's a, it, it, sometimes white belts are a pleasure to roll with, you know, because you're in, instructing and like, trust me, this will make a big difference. You're telling them like really juicy nuggets and you know how good they are. So it's, it's, you know, um, 
On the other hand, white belts are kind of wild and unpredictable. Mm. They can be. Mm -hmm. So white belts are actually some of the best people to roll with, especially at like brown belt, Mm. because you get so used to dealing with educated players, people that play jujitsu. Yes. You know, and, and then as a brown belt, you need to be able to, like, you're filling in all the holes because when you're a black belt, people expect a lot. Mm. They, there's high expectations. So to, to go against like some white belt bodybuilder who's just like, he can bench press you off. Mm. And, and, you know, an educated player would never do that. I'd never like bench press you off, but that guy will. And maybe you haven't been around that in a while. So like everyone is valuable in the hierarchy of BJJ. And there's something very soothing about the hierarchy. You know, if you ever, in the BJJ culture, people often gripe about the people that are very, very close to them in skill. Oh, that guy cranked it and he, blah, blah, blah. you know, well, I can't believe he got promoted and I didn't, you know, but if someone's a brown belt and you're a blue belt, like, you know, oh, that guy's just way better. And so it's, there's like that bickering, that competition, that vanity of minor differences is not, it doesn't really apply to mm-hmm. the people that are way above you or way below you, you know, it's, it's only at that level where people are duking it out for their place in the hierarchy. Um, and, and so there's something very satisfying about, about just knowing your place. It's so true. I think it's very, um, it's, it's very good for human beings existentially to, to be in hierarchical positions. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there in the world now about how hierarchies are, you know, tyrannical, only tyrannical, you know, and, you know, it's, <sighs> they're only oppressive, you know, and that's true sometimes in, in, in certain hierarchies when the, the top do oppress the bottom, but other times hierarchies give us a path. You know, they show us, I mean, to, to your example, Absolutely. Just, no, they're organized. That's right. Yeah. They, they, they're, they, they may make a map of, of this, of this, you know, okay. Pretty chaotic place. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> pretty, um, so I think being able to, um, you know, a hierarchy is a technology that we use to organize ourselves. Mm. There's nothing inherently wrong about it. Any technology can be misused. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's all about just like honestly evaluating where things are going awry. And, and we're finding that with our attention economy right now. And, you know, we're kind of poisoning ourselves, but hopefully we'll be able to be introspective, open-minded, adaptable, and change these things. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not too late. You know? And so, you know, just being able to, to talk about these things, this is really what I want to talk about. Mm. You know, I, I do jujitsu. That's my tech that I'm an expert in, but there's much bigger problems, um, that we need to, and it's part of the answer, but, it, but it's not the complete answer. And I tell you, villainizing the other side is not the answer either. No, absolutely. And, you know, it's uh, it's often a projection <laughs> of some kind of oh, no. <laughs> pure projection. Totally, totally. Yeah. No, it's uh, I I couldn't agree more. And you know, hierarchies. You know, if you if you can focus on them in that way, it can show you who you could be. You know, they can be inspiring. If I'm looking at a brown belt, go well, fuck you. You know, well, it's more like well, the reasons he or she is a brown belt is because look at how good they are in these positions, and look how you Absolutely. know natural they are in these. You know, that's um. It's, uh, I try to use that as inspiration, not as a source of resentment. For sure. And, and the idea of a meritocracy, the Jiu-Jitsu Academy is, although people have certain gifts and prior experience, maybe in a grappling art, but it's a meritocracy. Mm. And there aren't that many pure meritocracies in our societies. Uh, and we'd like to think that, you know, in the U.S. or in Western regions, it's like, that's how it is, but it's not. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we, we strive to make a more perfect union, but on the mat, your currency is your skill mm. and your skill level. Like you don't become the black belt without tapping 10,000 times, uh, without having your, you know, becoming disillusioned, working through plateaus, especially trust me, like white belt is a wonderful place to be. 
everything you, every new thing you learn could make a huge difference, <laughs> you know, and you're, and you're growing by leaps and bounds. Yeah. So it's wonderful. And when you finally get recognized in the club as a, I mean, you are in the, a very exclusive gentleman's club mm. when you earn that blue belt. And there's, that's such an amazing feeling mm. that it's a feeling that doesn't get old. And, you know, a lot of wealthy people are attracted to martial arts because it's something they can't buy. Yeah. It's something that has to be earned, isn't it? That's brilliant. I often thought that uh, confidence is something that has to be earned. You know, it's not a given. Oh, yeah. It's it's one of those things. Did you notice as you started moving through jujitsu, did you notice any changes in your mental health or in your perspective, the ways you saw the world? Um, the other reason I ask is that I've just noticed profound changes, you know, and one of the expressions that comes to mind is better to be a warrior in a garden than a garden in a warrior. That kind of self-confidence oh, yeah. that ensues as a result. I was just interested to hear about your journey. Oh my God. So, so many profound transformations. I was summing it up with, a uh, with, uh, Rick Ellis, uh, my, my buddy in black belt, you get tougher and you pull harder chicks. <laughs> like, like if, if you really summarize it, that, that is, and that's all we want really. I mean, there, there are so many sophisticated nuances, but on a primal level, that's what it does. But that transformation isn't just immediate. It takes a long time to be able to develop those qualities and attributes that people find inspiring, interesting, um, that they're attracted to because, you know, it's earned over time. Now I would say blue belt. I was so proud when I got my blue belt, you know, and purple, uh, I was winning stuff. And so it was like, I mean, that, that also, they all felt huge. Mm. Um, becoming a purple belt really made me feel that I was getting good at this jujitsu thing. And, and that was, that was, you know, blue, you're still, you're still tapping quite a bit. Um, and it's still a struggle to tap other people at purple mm. tapping. Other people becomes easy. Yeah. You tap but tapping other people becomes easy. And that is so incredibly pleasurable and it's, it's addictive. That's when you start, you're not learning how to drive the car. You're racing the car. Mm. You know, you have all that other stuff in your autonomic nervous system. So it's like you, you have that programmed in. So you can really focus on like, Oh, memorizing this course or that, or I got to beat that car. You can focus on those things, not the mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the self-efficacy and, you know, being able to rely on yourself to make decisions. And, you know, you, again, you, you go for a choke and they defend and then you go for another one. You're like, Oh, wow. I, I can navigate the world here. You know, if my boss says this to me, it's cool. I can adapt, you know, for, for sure. And you're not afraid to take action. And one of the greatest transformations and my instructor, Roy Harris really helped me with this because he gave me a, a pep talk one, one night we had some visitors. I was a blue belt, really talent. I mean, talented blue belt. And I just was, I was being too nice. Mm. And I think a lot of guys struggle with that. Jiu-jitsu really helped me not be a nice guy. Mm. It, it helped me be a guy who can be nice or as Jordan Peterson says, you know, you want to be a monster. Yeah. You want to be a monster because you can control that and you could be a savage if you need to. But, and so that's in all of us. It's not just me. It's in all of us. We all have that, but jujitsu is a mechanism that allows that to be unlocked. So what he pulled me, I was sparring with these visitors and I, I was being too nice. And he pulls me outside and he's like, Roy, you got it. You got to stop being nice. You got to tap these guys. He gave me permission to unlock that. Yeah. I went on the mat and I tapped those guys. Boom, 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 boom. Something like, something happened Interesting. inside of me. And I went home like, Oh my God, I can't believe that. And that changed that changed that really changed who I was. Yeah. And, and, and getting rid of that. Oh, I don't want to be a dick. I don't want to be an asshole. You know, you're going to be a dick and you're going to be an asshole sometimes to some people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't make a habit. Try to get through this life ethically. 
you know, honor people kindness when you, when you can, but not every situation calls for kindness. Yeah. So the moment I stop looking at attacking somebody as aggression and went into like a clinical dissection of their biomechanics, mm. it was clinical. It wasn't emotional. Mm. That really helped me go for things in life. Yeah including quitting my job when I was 31 years old to do some crazy thing, like teach jujitsu professionally, you know, that was seemed like suicide. Like, really? You're going to yeah, do that? Well, it, it's cool now to do that, but it wasn't kind of, it wasn't really cool back then. <laughs> it was, it was, it was gutsy. It was definitely yeah. gutsy, but I was like, you know what? This is, this is the way out of the nine to five. Yeah. I'm good at it. And all the signs from the universe, like I was teaching in San Diego and I started attracting students and it wasn't even advertising, but people were coming and I was like, that's a good sign. Mm. And it just, the signs pointed the way that this is working and I should go for it. And quitting my job was one of the best moves uh, I ever did. Cause this, you know, starting that YouTube channel, um, teaching, some of the apps that I've done and, and DVDs and titles that I've published, um, you know, none of that would have happened unless I took that chance and none of, I wouldn't have taken that chance unless I had kind of the fortitude and the risk analysis that jujitsu gives you. Yeah. It, you know, you mentioned Jordan Peterson. One of the things that I love that he talks about is this idea of, of empathy and nicety being, you know, we, we as society believe them to be inherently good, you know, but you also see that people who are overly empathetic or overly nice um, neglect their own worth more than anyone else. And they end up becoming trampled on. And, you know, that old idea about shadow integration and becoming a monster and the archetype of the beauty and the beast, these mm -hmm. are, it's, it's necessary for people to recognize these as not becoming a bad person, but becoming an integrated individual so mm -hmm. that, you know, your shadow. That's it. that's it. That's it. You can look after yourself when necessary. You can look after others, but not in, in so far as it also um, works symbiotically with, with who you are and what you want to do. Yeah. I, I think that shadow integration, you know, and it, if, if you don't integrate it, it's going to come out some other way, mass shootings, yes. you know, incels, mm -hmm. all, all those things. I mean, what those, what those guys need they need jujitsu. Mm -hmm. They need a mechanism, a tried and true mechanism that allows people to discover their inherent power mm -hmm. biomechanically and in terms of mental fortitude and dedication. Mm -hmm. You know, these are, it's, it's simple, but it's, it's, it's not, you know, it, it, it takes a while. It takes the right teachers too. That's one of the reasons that I, so, you know, I mean, I've been training a long time, never thought I'd be a like martial arts professional. Uh, but then one day it was like, that's what you need to do. And, and now I run an organization. We have, you know, a bunch of affiliates around the world and it's allowed me to tra travel and explore and just have incredible experiences mm -hmm. and broaden my horizons and allow other people to follow in that same path. You yes. know, I want, I, I, I want people to be more, um, integrated as international. I'm a citizen of the world mm. and jujitsu is like the, it's the best excuse to travel, mm. whether that's a competition or to go, to go to a seminar. You know, it's, it's a marvelous way. I mean, sport is an international language. So to be able to go to Portugal to compete or, you know, I've been to the Middle East several times to, I have a friend in Kuwait mm. and I've taught at his, at his school and oh, it's cool. just that, you know, seeing how life is over there, not through Fox news or any other news source and their kind of slanted skewed view of it. And you, you get to see, you hear the prayer call go out in the morning. You understand what Islam has done to unify those people. You know, it's not perfect, you know, but, but these are technology religions are technologies and you, and you get to see them in a more honest light. Um, when you travel, expand your horizons and jujitsu is a, is a pathway mm. um, to do that while you're young, right? Most people work, 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 work 55. Then we're going to do like, Oh, we're really going to blow it out. Go on a world cruise. Yeah. 
you know, it, it's, it's not too late. It's wonderful. But the earlier you can do that, I think the richer your life is going to be. Mm. And the more you appreciate the freedoms that we have here and some of the drawbacks of living, you know, in Western societies, whether Australia, US, UK, whatever. Mm, totally. I, I totally agree. It's, uh, it's fantastic. It's, um, you know, I think it's one of the reasons why, I don't know, I just feel like whenever I was watching your videos, that there, there always seemed to be, for me, it was kind of like, it, this isn't just about jujitsu, whether it's the way you edit it or you show the demonstrations and then you show the progressive belts. And then, you know, the final, I always thought that when he, when you came in at the very end, it was kind of like Bowser and super Mario Kart. And playing totally. the it's boss. a final boss, final boss. <laughs> it's so cool. It's so cool. And then the very end, discover who you are. You know, I think that's, um, that's so brilliant, mate. Do you, do you have any, like what's coming up for you now? Cause I, I know that you, you don't have your own Academy anymore. Is that right? That's, that's correct. Yeah. I sold that. I did eight years. I graduated my first black belt and I was like, dude, this is this. I was kind of at the end of my passion for running a full-time academy. And I had to do a gut check. Like, do I really want to do this for another three to five years? Mm -hmm. I, I did not have the passion. And if you're a martial arts professional, you know, I, there are people out there that can understand that. I've had several people talk to me about that, that very issue. Mm -hmm. So I decided, you know, I had eight years where everything was about me, Roy Dean Academy, everything was like very controlled. All my instructionals were, you know, done to the highest, you know, caliber that I could do at the time. And I said, you know what, let's do everything different. So I moved to Southern California and I said, this is about partnerships. So I started uh, training and teaching at my friend's school uh, down here in Palm Desert. I'm part of the team, but I have my own team. Yeah. You know, it's not one or the other. I can do, mm -hmm. and they love my, my guys coming into town. I have like an affiliate retreat here every year. They love it. This is a, a long standing school. It's been here like 30 years. Oh, wow. Um, those, these, the head instructors, Dan and Anthony, the, I was a blue belt. They were blue belts. Mm -hmm. I was a purple belt. They were purple belts, you know? So we have like a long history together. And I started making more contacts. Like for example, uh, Stanley Pran and the founder of Aikido journal uh, passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, I reached out to Josh Gold, who um, Stanley turned it over to. And Josh and I have become friends. We launched Aikido Journal Academy. Mm. So we made very, very high, like beautiful instructionals for the Aikido community. And we're just releasing a new, um, a new course called uh, uh, Power and Grace, Portrait of a Master, TK Chiba. Chiba was a, a feared and revered but controversial um martial artist he did judo and karate and i mean he would actually test it out he would test out his aikido cool. sometimes he'd end up with broken bones sometimes he broke people's bones <laughs> wow yeah and so we worked with um i've been working on this project for over a year hundreds of hours went yeah. into it a lot of time and it's a uh, poised to launch um uh, toward the end of the month mm. We worked with his organization, the Biron Kai, to go through, you know, like 30 years of video archives. Wow. And assemble this. And it's all, and it's a portrait of a master. It's a tribute. It's a fitting tribute to, to a master in Budo. And this is, you know, part of my paying respects to the art of Aikido. Mm. Uh, doing stuff that's outside the realm of BJJ. Because BJJ turns into like this little fishbowl. And I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm more than that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more than that. Other people are more than that. I'm not just a jujitsu instructor. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm something else. Yeah. And so, um, I've also done, I'm starting pre-production on purple belt 2.0. Oh, uh, nice. So yeah, 10 years ago I did uh, blue belt 1.0 that instructional changed my life was, um, it's really helped a lot of people around the world. Mm. I mean, I, I got a lot, it's, it's helped a lot of people and purple belt is, you know, I'm reimagining what I can do is my first conceptual DVD back in the day and then app. And, and, um, so I'm working on that. I'm also working on another course, 
um, that I want to do over the summer. Um, and so I have, I have quite a few projects going, I'm redeveloping all my apps. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on, you know, part of it is the jujitsu instruction. Part of it is media content and the yeah. technical, uh, know-how of like working with developers and getting this that, and checking all the boxes and, you know, I mean, Apple, you know, developer accounts and working with BJJ fanatics and, you know, it's, it's about relationships Yes, and, and extending that influence. And I, I tell you, Tom, you're hundred percent right. It's not just about the technique or jujitsu. I'm trying to impart like a transmission mm -hmm. of knowledge and maybe something else that comes through the video that's positive, inspiring, and gives people a positive impression of this technology. Mm. Uh, even if they don't understand like what's happening or why they like it, but everything matters. You know, the music selection, the way you edit, the pacing of it, um, everything matters. And, you know, hopefully this will inspire a lot of people um, that's what it's about. It's not about me. It's about, you know, using my good fortune to be able to like spread this technology and, um, make a better world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it, it certainly had a profound impact on the way I view jujitsu, you know, and it's something that, you know, I played footy footy here, which was, um, kind of our equivalent of the NFL over there and just kind of mm. banged up my body a bit too much in my early twenties. And then I found CrossFit, but my mental health deteriorated in my early twenties. And I've always mm. kind of been searching since then and uh, coming into jujitsu and, and seeing now that if I, if I play and roll in a style that's lower intensity, more technique focused um, using my strength, if I need to, um, but focusing on the technique and trying to setting my CrossFit weightlifting background on the side that this is actually a path that, you know, is pay for me, hopefully decades and decades into the future. And, um, you know, I certainly kind of see that, um, through your videos and the way you edit them and, 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 and how they're put together. So yeah, I, I, I really appreciate you for all the content that you've, um, you've uh, given the world Roy. It's brilliant. And I'd have to get you back on the show, mate. This is such a fantastic podcast and it went exactly in the in direction that, that I wanted it to with the wider implications of the sport in psychology and politics, even and philosophy as well. So it was really fun. Tom, it was a pleasure. This was excellent. And I look forward to the next time. Cool guys. Thank you so much for listening. Speak to you next week. Bye. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.